then uh, I will bring the conference school committee meeting to order. I will note that we are being recorded and broadcast via Zoom. And uh, bring the Conquer Kyle Regional School Committee meeting to order. Great. Um, and we, but before we go, I know we're going to do public comments, but just want to welcome those of us who are here. I know we have some a few extra people here, and we're looking forward to recognizing some people. But welcome to everybody who's here watching. Um, before we jump in, are there any public comments? And if you want to make a public comment, you can use the little function in Zoom to raise your hand or ask a question. Do we have to ask a question? Star nine. Okay, star nine or star nine. That's the question. Um, Don't forget the roll call. Oh, we do have a question. <gasps> Mary Hartman's hand is raised. Yes. Mary. Yes, and we can hear you. Join Good. us. Good. Thank you. The floor is yours. Can you just identify yourself more other yes. than? Yes. My name is Mary Hartman. I'm on the Finance Committee. I'm here representing the Finance Committee. I just wanted to make a brief comment uh, that we're happy to see the changes that you've made to your agenda, which is to put public comment um, at the beginning, to add the budget as a permanent item on the agenda. Um, Arguably, you're one of the most important committees in the town, so this makes it a whole lot easier to recruit someone from the Finance Committee to come and observe your meeting. So I just wanted to let you know, thank you for that. Oh, good. Very glad. Thanks for mentioning it. I'm glad that's working out well. Good. Uh, okay, good. Uh, we do have to do a roll call. Uh, oh, yes, for uh, attendance. One of, my, one, one of these days, we'll remember that without being reminded. Exactly. Uh, Rainy? Hi, here. Oh. Here. Booth. Here. Odell. Here. Mustafi. I had no chance tonight. Okay. Clear that up. Uh, any other public comments? Doesn't look like it. I don't. I don't see any. Okay. Uh, Lori, you want to take it away here? Sure. So given how different everything is, many of our normal processes and celebrations to honor those who are retiring are um, not available. So we thought it would be just a nice gesture to take this. Sure. So given how different everything is, well, um, to just uh, note the, the retirees and um, just a couple of words about maybe what they've contributed and how long they were here and the impact that they've made. And certainly all seven of them are in that category. Um, I'm glad Mike's here tonight because he's going to talk about uh, the four of the retirees are from the high school. Um, and I'm just going to quickly open that up with a few words about some of the others. So, and I, they were invited. I don't know that they're all here. So if they are here and want to be known, I don't know, turn your video on or wave at us or whatever you're comfortable with. So <laughs> um, I'm just first going to recognize two teachers at Thoreau. Uh, Peggy Harrington is a special educator at Thoreau. She's been in the district for 23 years, um, really committed to ensuring unique needs of every student uh, on her caseload are met, more often than not exceeding. Um, she serves as a model of individualized education for the district. Uh, her depth of knowledge, particularly in the area of supporting students with reading, will certainly leave a hole that'll be hard to fill. So we really wish Peggy well. I know there are many times Peggy was able to um, pitch in and help out with very uh, her depth of knowledge. Not that a, 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 a little bit atypical situations where we needed services for students that maybe um, came from a different direction, and she was just always willing to pitch in and help out. So we're grateful to Peggy and wish her well. Um, Roseanne Swain, and I'll qualify this one to say Roseanne Bates decided to stay until December, uh, wanting to help us get through the transition of whatever the fall brings. So we're grateful for that. Uh, Roseanne's been in the district for 22 years, and as someone who's enjoyed her classroom on a number of occasions, um, 
you know, Roseanne's just always singing and dancing and the kids are playing recorders. And I think most noteworthy to me, the last couple of times I was there, at least one of them, um, she had included all the students from the special education on a number and program, the intensive special education program, and was really making them feel part of the kindergarten classroom. And unbeknownst to me until about an hour ago when Mrs. Charles told me this, she also wrote the Thoreau School song. So we're grateful for Roseanne and we're Looking forward to her help in getting the year going and um, finishing out 2020 with her. Uh, Doug Shattuck is the third of those that I'm going to speak about. Doug's at the middle school and he's the applied technology. So we're a great teacher. Um, he's been here for 15 years because this is actually a second career for Doug. Um, his commitment to the district STEAM mission has just been invaluable. Um, most secondary schools will create safe spaces, um, as many of them as possible, to help kids find their people in their niche. Doug created many opportunities, many, many opportunities for middle school students that offer enrichment through science, technology, engineering, and math. Um, really unique. Doug brought a unique opportunity, as many of them as possible, to help kids find their people in their niche. Their ed, um, and I think some of you were here. We brought Doug in the MIT robotics work that he did. Um, a couple of years, um, really years ago, and that's really put a stage out for those kids and for the middle school. So nice showcase work by Doug. So we're wishing him well, well as well. And I'm going to ask Mike to talk on the other four retirees. Yeah, great. Thank you. I do have um, a neighbor's a dog barking in the background. I do apologize for that. Hopefully, um, stop. So we do. Uh, I have four retirees. I'd like to. On our side, I've asked to uh, keep it brief. I could talk at length um, about all of them, but we will keep it brief. In addition to that, we have two others, um, not with us, but members of the, the district that are retiring that I'll just touch on briefly as well. Uh, just gonna do it in alphabetical order. So we'll start with Peter Atlas. Peter has been a member of the math department for 32 years, is well respected by staff and students. Uh, he's taught a full range of courses, including our most challenging math classes. Our AP program in math is um, is amazing. Uh, the kids perform very well, and, and Peter's um, you know a big part of that. Uh, not once but twice, uh, students have honored Peter with the yearbook dedication, um, as well as a graduation speaker. That includes this year, so we will see, see Peter at graduation. Um, and he's also been honored by Stanford University's Terman Award, which is the highest honor for influential influential high school teachers. So thank you, Peter, for your service. Patty Brinton, um, she, Patty has been with us for 18 years. And for 18 years, Patty has guided students to success in the classroom and on the MCAS exam. Patty created her own curriculum in reading, writing, and study skills to do so. <clears throat> Patty's creativity, involvement with student employment, and building a community within our school helps students who struggle with learning earn a diploma. She's a beloved teacher, and her students adore her. You know, we often hear about social emotional learning. It's really a buzzword in the field of education. Um, you know, Patty has been modeling social emotional learning for 18 years. Her, her kids adore her and it really is a home base for them. Um, you, they, you see them often hang out and, and it's kids who struggle and she's helped a lot of them graduate. So well done and thank you for your service, Patty. Michael Hamill, Michael Hamill has been with uh, us at CCHS for 13 years. And he's made a significant contribution to the science department as well as to the school community. Within three years of arriving at CCHS, he began the robotics team. And in the third year, uh, they were already on a plane heading to St. Louis for qualifying for the first robotics world championship. Uh, Michael helped build an engineering program dedicated to attracting more students to the field and also actively recruiting more women in the field. In our robotics team, which is pretty impressive, is about a 50-50 gender breakdown of female and male. And that's, you know, that's not typical. Oftentimes you're really struggling to get, um, um, you know, attract um, females to the program. And it's really a testament to Mike and, and also other members uh, of the team. Um, Michael, in addition to that, Mike helped build an engineering program dedicated um, to, uh, I'm sorry, um, build an engineering certificate which really is a badge of honor at our school. And again, it's it's all aimed at getting more kids excited about science, um, excited about engineering. And when you talk to Mike, that's really where his, um, you, you know, where, where his interest lies, getting kids excited about tinkering and, um, and just, you know, about the field of engineering. 
you know, he's one of the smartest and most humble people I know. Also one of the kindest, um, you know, he has a passion for teaching and a passion for kids and, you know, he'll be missed. So thank you for your service, Mike. Uh, and little and little joined the special education department at CCHS uh, in 2007 after career in business and also some time off raising her children. As a special educator, she has worked in several programs helping a broad range of students with a whole um, host of um, strengths and challenges. And it's really a testament to her skill set and her ability to connect with a wide range of kids. In addition to her role as a special educator, Anne has taught a course um, for the Concord Fellows Program. And she also is um, uh, the VHS virtual high school coordinator and has really helped that program get off the ground and to run. She's a true professional who works tirelessly to develop strong program for students. I know her uh, staff and students alike will miss her. And so uh, thank you very much for your, uh, your years of service. Uh, last two, very quickly, um, member of the building service staff is Fritz Pruner, who's been with us for 28 years. Uh, and he is retiring. I know he's going to spend a lot of time fishing. Thank you, Fritz. Uh, and last but certainly not least is Mary Tassari. She's been in the district for 31 years. Um, she was hired she first as an assistant to the to the principal, and then in, into the um, as a registrar. Before that, she was a kindergarten teacher, um, and it had other positions too. And just you know, one of the nicest people um, I've ever met. And so, thank you, Mary, for your service. And that's everybody. We do see a few of these folks here. I wonder if they'd be willing to turn their video on so we could just thank them. Peter. Peter. Hi, Peter. Hey, Peter. Hi. So I, I'd like to uh, echo the, the tribute and say that uh, I personally valued my relationship with the folks who are stepping away from the Concord and Concord Carlisle schools. Um, I assure you that uh, there, there's a life beyond CPS and CC, uh, and you know that, and I'm sure it'll be wonderful, uh, but you will be missed. And uh, Charlie Booth, one of my sons, uh, made a special point of asking uh, me to extend to you his personal appreciation. Uh, he does remember you, and perhaps you remember him as well, among the legions of kids that you've helped uh, to teach and mature and grow up and lead happy lives. So thank you all. I'll just add one last round of people I think we want to be sure we acknowledge Mike did a nice job of including um, some of his administrative assistants and the custodial staff. Um, we are losing some long time administrative assistants in the main offices of two of the elementary schools. Bev Lucas is retiring from Willard. I think we would after, I don't know how many years, I don't have it in front of me, a long time. Um, and Thoreau is losing both ladies in the front office, Maria Schofield and Donna McCone. Maria's been here 40 something years. I just, I'm often um, finding that just hard to really even fathom. So huge, huge shoes to fill in both the Willard and Thoreau main offices. And we're just so grateful for all of their service because every good principal, right, Mike, every principal knows who really runs the school. So <laughs> we're glad for all the stability and organization that they bring. Well, we certainly want to thank everyone for their service and the uh, schools are better for them. Mm -hmm. And uh, we won't, unlike court, we won't make you come onto the school committee. Right. <laughs> <laughs> certainly do that if you want to. But <laughs> Very good. So thank you and enjoy yeah. your, your time away from the schools. Very much so. I will only add that in a time that we're in like now where there's so much instability that seeing the faces um, and even the names of teachers and staff like you all who have provide su provided such stability to students over the years, um, it just highlights the value of that. So thank you so much for all that you have given to these students for so many years. And if I, I may just say one thing, I mean, uh, the reality is you know, the single most important factor in a student's education is the teacher. And it's not socioeconomic status, it's not funding levels. Um, you know, there, there certainly there are factors that play in, 
but the, 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 the most important thing is the teacher uh, or the teachers or the staff members. And, you know, having taken classes at, uh, at BC and then also at Middlesex when I was in the off season, you know, I had some fantastic classes in both places and I had some terrible classes in both places and it's all due to the quality of the teacher. So, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a big loss to lose the institutional knowledge of the folks that have been there for a long time. And, and, um, you know, but this is part of uh, part of the reality, isn't it? Well, you have our, our heartfelt thanks. Very much so. And thanks for coming tonight for those of you who are here too. Thank you. Shall we All right. carry on? Shall we move on? Yes. Um, did we, let's see. Um, we do have people from CEF here. Did we want to think about moving that up in the agenda? I, I was hoping we would if that was the committee's will. Yeah. 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 It probably mm -hmm. makes sense. It, um, if people are up for that, could we have a motion for both committees to move um, the item CEF grants from reports for discussion to now in the agenda? I, I, what? Uh, so uh, move so for both. Yep. Thank you, Court. Second for both. Okay, great. Any discussion on that? Uh, then I'll go through roll call. By roll call, Rainey? Aye. Booth? Aye for both. Uh, Johnston? Aye for both. Mustafi? Mustafi for region, aye. And Modell? Aye for region. Okay. Well, thank you all. And Ms. Trulo votes to move Ninth Grade Academy up as well. Aye. Nice chime. <laughs> <laughs> Can we mute him? <laughs> we just like having you around, Mike. We're going to keep you a while. You can mute whoever you don't want to listen to. Uh, uh, I'll get us back on track. I want to welcome uh, Rich Perkins and Sean Miller. And I can't see if anyone else is here from CEF, so I'll turn it over to them. Um, as always, we are enormously grateful for their support and generosity. Um, I'll let them talk on the data, but we had a great turnout of uh, grants go in. And I, you know, having talked with them just briefly, I know um, we're as well supported as ever. And in such challenging times, that probably is um, a list, frankly. So. so, Rich, how about I turn it over to you and then you and Sean can take it from there? Uh, I'm I'm Rich Perkins. Uh, I'm one of the co-presidents, along with Denise Jansen, who was unable to be here tonight. Uh, but uh, the other uh, member of the committee is Bill Stone is here, uh, and Sean Miller will take it away in a second. Here he is the uh, the grants uh, committee chair. Uh, but all I wanted to say was um, uh, I think uh, we we had a, we had a good year, you know, despite what's going on. And I I can't say enough how much. Uh, uh, our partnership with um, the school system has sort of really de developed and evolved. And I, I feel like the the partnership is really strong now. We have a lot of back and forth with with many members uh, on on the um, you know the school side. So uh, I just hope that continues. Um, and with that, I'll hand it over to Sean Miller to just quickly run through uh, the grants that we approved this year. Testing that you can hear me? Yes, we can. No, now we can't. Oh. There we go. Oh, Good. It. How about now? Better. Yes. All right. Hey, Richie, thank you. And everybody, thank you very much for getting us on the agenda today. Today, uh, My name is Sean Miller. I'm on the grants committee. And obviously, Richie is with us and my co-chair in the grants committee, Bill Stone. So. For those of you who don't know CEF, we're a nonprofit group uh, comprising entirely of Concord and Carlisle parents. And primarily what we do is we raise money and then teachers uh, submit special grants for special initiatives, novel ideas, creative things that they want to institute or implement into their classes. And then uh, we get together as a team and we look at them and we fund them or we don't. 
Um, so, Richie, you mentioned it. This was a crazy year. I know everyone's going through uh, everything that's over the past couple of months, but we actually beat our numbers from last year. So, last year we had 21 submissions. This year we had 23. So, I've been on the grants committee now for three years, and you always have those those uh, butterflies like, oh my gosh, are we going to get enough grants? Are people hearing us that they want to submit? So, I love it the fact that we got a 23 in this environment. Um, of those 23, we approved 14. So uh, roughly uh, 30, well, we've got them all, you know, well, actually, so the total number was 80, roughly $81,000 that we approved for funding this year. Uh, Concord, the high school, right around 31, CMS, right around 25, and the elementary schools combined, right around 25. So. We're super excited about that. And just a quick highlight in some of the grants that we approved. Um, exploring uh, many roles within math. Uh, we had Chinese folk art submissions. We approved some uh, projects around executive functioning. We approved um, uh, engaging in statecraft. Uh, my, one of my favorites here was virtual reality for the classrooms. A uh, very creative project by Mr. Cameron around an innovation program at CMS where students uh, are coming up with ideas to improve the school. So a whole myriad of different topics, uh, but we're very excited. I do have the checks here, if you can see them. Uh, the total is $80,768.96. And to Richie's notes, our words a couple moments ago, it's been Great, the synergy working with the uh, with all of you and all the teachers. So thank you. <laughs> thank you. It's amazing. I was glad we could help uh, quickly on short notice, uh, providing some funding for the Zoom, uh, uh, the Zoom platform, which I think was you know we're all mostly using now. So anyway. Yep. Uh, thank you. Great. Year. I am too. I am too, Rich. Thank you for that. That was. That was your initiative as a committee to reach out to me and say, do you need something as we closed? And the answer was yes. So <laughs> thank you. Uh, Sean and, and Rich, thank you very, very much. Uh, I wonder if you might uh, direct the folks who are listening in to uh, the, the website or any other ways to link up with CEF. I'm sure it's a simple search one could do, but uh, uh, we know that you do several events each year and, uh, uh, and, and appeal, just general appeals. Am I correct? Yeah, well, we have, yeah, we have quite a few, um, you know, events each year. The big one is in the fall. We had our 25th, which some of you may have attended, and that was a very good, uh, great turnout. Um, of course, we're a little concerned about what's going to happen this fall, so we're a little concerned about our fundraising going forward. However, I would like to say we, our, our, our senior balloon drive um, where we put uh, deliver balloons to seniors. Um, normally we sell about 250 and this year we sold 450. Mm -hmm. So we kind of doubled our numbers there almost. So, so that was good. But the, the website is conquerededfund.org. And um, if you look at the, there's a history section or a grants history. Um, a, a lot of the projects um, have little blurbs on them. So, you, you know, with the teacher's name and, um, it gets, you know, fairly granular. Um, we're always looking for pictures, by the way, if anybody here is, uh, uh, has, uh, submitted a grant, we, we always need photos, but, uh, so if you go to the website, uh, you'll, you'll find out all about us. So Great. it's you. really been an honor for me. I'm, I'm rolling off as president, uh, uh, Denise and Leah Butler will be, uh, co-presidents next year. So it's been a real uh, honor for me. Um, I'll, I'll be on for one more year as a, institutional memory so all right wonderful thank you uh, i'll also jump in on that as a parent i have always really appreciated uh the opportunity to donate on behalf of a teacher at the end of the year um and i you know was able to do that this year and it's a great way i feel like to thank our teachers and be able to write a personal note to them and donate to cef in their name as as a kind of as a thank you at the end of the year. So I would point that out to anybody who's listening too. It's a great way to support CEF. And, and I will also just echo the thanks. I mean, the, the opportunities and the value that CEF brings to the students in our schools is, is just incredible. And 
And if you look at what I love too is not just each individual project every year, but if you look at some of the things that have been going on at these schools for years now, many of them were teed up by CEF initially. Um, and that's just so valuable to these students, to the whole district, to the whole community in, in those opportunities you bring. So thank you so much for the time that you guys and the whole board puts into this. It's incredibly appreciated. Right. Well, that is our mission. We we try to, you know, we're, we're new and innovative. So whatever uh, programs that, you know, sort of get voted on in, in a positive way, you know, eventually they, you know, they've just become part of the normal program, you know, Rivers and Revolution and uh, the engineering certificate uh, that my son participated in. And uh, he had Mr. Hamblin as a teacher, I might say. So uh, great program. Nice. That's great. Yeah, we need CF more than ever. <laughs> yes. Uh, we'll, be, we'll be here. Okay, thank you so much for your support. <laughs> we may just need to innovate a little next year. I don't know. Just throw it yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We'll be ready. Thank you. Thank, thank, you, you, thank you guys so much. Yeah. Um, uh, okay. You want to go back to correspondence? Yes, back to <laughs> the agenda. Um, correspondence, so we had a couple of letters in response to the uh, statement, the letter that we all released last week regarding racial equality um, uh, in both directions. A couple of letters that had showed great appreciation and one who wasn't as comfortable with our wording, but we responded to all saying, thank you so much for your feedback. Um, that's about it. On, I don't think that there were any others. Were there, Wally, that I'm missing? No, that was it. Okay. Um, so chairs and liaison reports. Um, for, well, before we do chairs reports, because we do want to talk about schedule, are there any liaison reports from other groups to report back in? Um, okay. I have one from um, for the CPAC. Great. If I may. I just wanted to let you know that uh, uh, CPAC has uh, sent out and shared the annual report with all the school, school committee members. And um, uh, this year, um, they are not able to hold their uh, formal presentation. So um, if uh, any school committee members uh, have any questions, please take a, a little time and um, go through it and reach out to uh, Carol uh, Yell or myself. Just wanted to uh, extend some thank yous. And thank you to Carol, uh, Carol Yell and the board members for all the hard work uh, supporting families. Uh, CPAC is very important, um, uh, supporting a uh, group, providing um, connection to information. And um, uh, CPAC holds, uh, was holding this year some uh, great workshops and forums along with um, our superintendent and Ruth uh, Gruby. So thank you so much. So, uh, uh, um, I'd like to follow up and simply say that uh, the report, which uh, is a short five pages, is a, a brilliant summary of a, a lot of work and uh, and speaks to the commitment of the of the council. So um, I'd like to echo your remarks uh, with with uh, a thank you as well for putting together the, the summary report of the year and setting the stage for next year. And that's that's available at ConcordCPAC.org. These are some great volunteers, so mm -hmm. doing a very important work. Hopefully, we'll get more people to step up and enjoy the ranks of the CPAC, Concord CPAC. Definitely. Mm -hmm. um, great. Any other liaison reports? Uh, I can report that the uh, policy subcommittee, which uh, has two members and will be uh, uh, down to one member when Mr. Modell uh, leaves the school committee, uh, will need to uh, shore up its membership as we seat new uh, subcommittees and liaison roles um, uh, over the summer and the fall. Uh, for the present time, simply to uh, 
continue with some momentum on our work and to take advantage of David Modell's uh, participation before he leaves, we're going to have a meeting on July 8th uh, at 11 o'clock. That will be a publicly posted meeting, and that will be for purposes of capping the year and uh, beginning to set priorities for next year. Great. Thanks for doing that. That's great. Um, you Just know, a let's... question, you guys. So your new committee can't seat till your town meeting, right? Uh, we're not. We're waiting on a clarification on uh, Alexa uh, joining us because uh, she's taking over a seat that was vacated, mm -hmm. uh, but we haven't got that yet. I, I studied the town charter today, and I couldn't come up with an answer. Okay. Okay. So uh, Alexa was kind enough to join us uh, tonight, although uh, we can't do anything formal until the town clerk weighs in. Yeah, and I've got a message in there. And on our side, I don't know, is it when, the, it can't be before the school committee in Carlisle first has a meeting, right? Correct. So can't appoint a regional. Yeah. So, so that'll be in July, right, Dave? It'll be sometime in July, because the election's not till June 30. So yeah. the, the meeting of, if we're having a meeting on June 30, which is a Tuesday. Yep. I'm still, you still have me. And... Possibly even on the eighth. <laughs> Depends. I don't know what our schedule is going to be in the summer. Okay. Yep. Um, well, that's a good foray in. Actually, I was just going to jump in before we get to that. I, we do want to talk schedules. Um, just a quick update from the building committee. The, and this is conquered quickly, but um, really only in case anybody's following, as everybody knows, the building committee announced that we would take a temporary pause once the preliminary feasibility report was put out. Uh, so the update is only that that is still being completed. So we're not quite officially in, in pause stage yet, but that document is um, hopefully reaching its, its last phase very soon, and then we will officially be taking our pause. So just wanted to update on that. Um, but back to actual chair's report and, and scheduling. First, I did want us all to congratulate both Alexa Anderson and Fatima Mezdad, who are going to be joining the school committee for Concord. So we are very excited to have them both join us. Um, as Wally said, uh, we're trying to find out about when Alexa can take that seat since it's already vacant. And we're assuming that Fatima will join uh, after our town meeting when Wally steps down. Uh, so scheduling wise, um, Wally, I know you had suggested we bring this up, but looking at our schedule going forward, do we want to move to every other week again? Always, of course, with the opportunity to add one when we need it. But as we get into the summer, I think the question is, do we really need to assume that we're meeting weekly still, or could we default to bi-weekly? So I wanted to put yeah, that. I think we could either, if we choose to do this, we could either schedule every other week or we could schedule weekly uh, and you know, cancel unless, as long as there's not something critical that needs to be discussed on that interim, which is really just related to uh, the situation we're in and the work that's going to have to be done over the summer. But, it, you know, I think to a certain degree that would be helpful for superintendent to weigh in on as to uh, whether we schedule one with the expectation we're going to cancel it. Um, but that's assuming we want to move to this once every two weeks. Yeah, I mean, I, it's a mixed bag, right? So it's certainly work for us to keep up with the pace of agendas and postings and all of that on a weekly basis. And, and then be sure we know what we're going to share out with you based on the progress we're making. And that's really, really important with all the unknowns. Um, and then the other side of this is there are going to be times we absolutely need a meeting because the budget needs, you know, you need to hear a progress report on the budget as we're making our way through and to hear what we're starting to craft and some of the decisions that are being considered going into that, I think probably in a more iterative way than you're used to. Um, 
because some are substantial changes that um, would be worth a little more discussion along the way. So I think we can make it work from either side. Uh, I think it's a matter of whether we build the structure and then decide when we don't need it, or we just know that we're going to work with every other week and um, have robust discussions at that point. So I wouldn't mind a break somewhere in June, probably just to catch our breath because of the pace of June. But other than that, I think we're flexible either way. I think part of our thinking also has to be that uh, we are more reliant on. I wouldn't mind. We're, we're more reliant on external events and information than we normally are. Um, mm -hmm. Desi notably. Uh, mm -hmm. So I think if we don't have a an agenda that's worthy of a meeting, let's cancel it. But I think we should be ready to be, to your point, Lori, uh, more, more nimble than we've ever been in a summer. Yeah. What is the, um, isn't it this week that Desi is supposed to give its guidance? Yeah. It was, it was going to be Friday when we met with the superintendents met with the commissioner. I'm sorry, it was supposed to be yesterday, which is what, Monday? Do you know what day it is? Uh, when we met with the commissioner on Friday, he said we would definitely have it by the end of the week. So they're running a few days later than we expected. So we uh, should, we did I mean, it sounds like we should definitely plan on a meeting on the 23rd, assuming that probably we right. have that in hand, right? But didn't I heard somebody told me that he might, it might not be till the week next week he all i know is what he said to us on friday was definitive definitive um wednesday no later than friday so i would agree with mr modell that if we do get that on friday i think just to make people you know it often in the press is not exactly reported correctly or in one part of the press so i think it would be helpful to try to describe that to people. So Wally, back to your question, maybe we book every week and then as um, you know, the, the posting needs to get done, we review whether there's enough updated information to bring forward. And I think- Because it is gonna be unpredictable to a point, yeah. so. I think what we could do is in that interim week is just have a very simple uh, agenda Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's the challenge of putting an agenda out um, if we don't cancel it by Thursday um, yes. because we've got to put something on the agenda. So I assume if there's not something to put on the agenda, we can cancel it, but then you run into something like uh, this where we won't know until Friday if it's going to be Friday or Monday. Um, so we could, uh, we could, we could, Put a meeting on the agenda for the 23rd, and the topic uh, could be this uh, debrief on on uh, Desi guideline. And uh, you know, if we don't get that, we'll cancel. Yeah, and then I think in July we're going to need a few meetings on the budget. So as we get okay. both as we're building it, and then as we're tightening up the numbers. So. Okay. So I think what I'm hearing is we we book one every week and um, yeah. highlight uh, after next week we highlight uh, the 30th if we do it the 30th the 30th and the you know every two weeks as to definitely going to have a meeting and the other ones are tentative. Yeah, but it, that's it, I was going to say even if we did just. Just plan to do it every two weeks that we all keep our schedule clear at five o'clock on Tuesdays mm -hmm. for the foreseeable future. Yes. Um, just a question. If, even if this does come in next week, I just want to think about what our goal and discussion would be a few days later. Is it is it really relevant to go through it all without much time to kind of process it and think? Is it is it even more valuable? to give, I don't know, task force or administrators a little time with it and then discuss it after a week when there's a little more understanding of the ramifications? Or maybe not. I just want to throw that out as a factor. I mean, my view is the in people are waiting anxiously for the information. So yeah. mm -hmm. just disseminating the raw, the raw guidance as use, even if we don't, mm -hmm. we don't need to feel compelled to weigh in on advice. No. I agree that Dr. Hunter. Okay. 
and her team should do it. But I don't think, because we've become a forum of information, I believe we should not delay if it comes out, maybe it won't, but if it does, I think we should be prepared to at least have Dr. Hunter discuss it, you know, and just it's out there. I mean, so people- yep. can, that makes it. sense. And it's gonna be the primary information that we're gonna receive that we don't generate ourselves within the district that uh, uh, informs the budget process. Yeah. So, you know, the sooner we uh, uh, look at it together, the better. And, uh, and reveal it publicly or help help reveal it publicly. And to, and, Cynthia's, uh, to Cynthia's point, some of the media coverage, in fact, was uh, quite incorrect with some of the previous advisories. Yeah. Yep. Yep, that makes sense. Um, uh, okay, so we're scheduling I... for next week. Well, we're going to schedule for each week, but but with the potential plan to remove every other meeting unless there's something important to go through. Um, if we're still scheduling for next week, can we just do a quick touch base on status of, uh, of the, Lori's evaluation? That will be the 30th. That's the 30th, okay. Right up to the end. <laughs> All right. I just wanna give her plenty of opportunity to see it beforehand. And I'm not yeah. optimistic that I could do that for the 23rd without. Right. No, okay. No, I only. When are, I apologize, but when are our individual inputs due? Last Tuesday. They were due last Tuesday? Correct. Okay, because I got confused in the conflicting forms then. So. Understood. Can you send me the most current form to use? Yep. All right, thank you. I will. But I'm going to do it after the meeting, so I don't <laughs> lose my focus. Yes. Heather. Yeah. If I might, I, I want to return to the building committee uh, to simply uh, reference the fact that uh, I don't believe we will see another version of the feasibility report draft uh, before the pause that uh, that's going to get picked up when the whole project gets picked up. Um, the timetable is such that that simply wouldn't happen. And, you know, that's going to be a, a key piece around which uh, we're going to re-engage the community. And that's been one of the big issues is that that's so compromised right now. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, thank you for clarifying. OK, so we're basically good with schedules for now. OK. Um, then on to superintendent's report. Thank you. I'm really going to stay on a positive note of closure, I think, given the last few days. Um, a lot of end of year things happening and really kudos to everyone that were able to create celebrations and opportunities for kids. You know, I, a lot of you know, I've been to four parades in the last 24 hours over at the high school, first the middle school, and then today all three elementaries, and then even the preschool. Really kudos to everyone that were was here at Ripley giving out the belongings and waving kids out and all of that. So it's been really a lot of fun and exposure to see kids at grades five, eight, and then 12, of course, back when we did that one. Um, just a few updates on what we're sending out to families for the summer. We're updating belongings, getting our list of summer learning opportunities. You've heard bits and pieces of that. Uh, the partnership with the library, highlighting that, uh, bringing back our list, our vast list of resources and all that that offers reminding you that we're leaving laptops with the kids all summer and really encouraging um, families to make decisions, partnerships on what level of, you know, opportunity they want to offer their kids or if they need the reprieve or a mix of both. Um, and then just another highlight or two of professional development. We have the kids are done on Thursday of this week. So Friday is a teacher day. We're having staff meetings at every building as well as professional development options all of which are very highly focused on um, technology and blended learning and all of the work we have to do and know we're gonna need um, expertise in, additional expertise in, in the fall. And then that rolls right into the summer where we're offering a wide range of technology. And some of that's really just how to use technology, but a lot of it is about pedagogy with the technology and remote blended learning. Um, we've added an SEL component with the mindset of approaching social emotional under the offering a wide range of 
technology and some of that's really just how to use technology, but a lot of it is about pedagogy with the technology mode, blended learning. Um, we've added an SEL component for all kids. So that'll be another element, social, emotional, under the guise that kids are all coming out of um, really challenging months here and whatever we're entering will be a lot of end of year pieces and, um, you know, we're, we're relieved, but we're excited too. It's just a great, great week to wind it all up, even, uh, even in such an odd, different way than normal. So, so that's my report. We'll get into a number of the other obvious pieces and, um, you know, we're, we're rigid in all of that as we go through the agenda. Can I just add an extra shout out for the parades? I got to be part of the fifth grade parade for Willard today. And it was, you know, especially for parents who, who cries at every clap out usually the last day. <laughs> um, it was emotional and teary for lots of people and very, very special. And the kids were so excited and proud and just, it was so much fun for them to see the teachers cheering them on. So just a big yeah. shout out. And I know that was the same for all of them. That's the one I got to see in person. So thank you to all of them who organized all of those. And just, you know, thanks to everybody. That took everyone's willingness and engagement. And, you know, I've now been to parades for pre-K through 12 or post-12 even. And people, you know, the staff came out in droves. And not just teachers. We had bus drivers there. We had custodians out there. We just really had this outpouring. You know, I've been, of course, families coming out. And I think in our heads, we thought it might be a, you know, one child and a parent or even just the high school kids, but total family events, um, whole families coming and the pets and the whole thing. There's just, just been a really great, great thing. We glad we were able to do it. I think. Okay. Anything else? We'll get to other things as the uh, evening goes on here. So I'll wait for that. Great thing. We've okay. Do we want to move this other stuff up, up in front of the ninth grade academy? <laughs> <laughs> Mike. Not funny, sir. That would be amazing. Uh, so is that me? Is that my cue? That's your cue. Okay, great. And, um, I, you know, obviously I was here, I don't know, sometime back and gave a detailed explanation of ninth grade academy. I know you have a packed agenda, so I'm not going to do the full presentation. Uh, you know, this is more uh, of an update. I guess I will give a little bit of just a, um, you know, a little history, a little background. So really this started, it's born out of our work, continued work with Challenge Success. Um, and we started this nearly two years ago. And so we're really excited to launch it come the fall. Um, it's, we've done a lot of research and it's been a lot of meetings. We still continue to meet as an entire uh, group and also to um, in smaller cohorts to talk about Ninth Grade Academy. Uh, we all know that ninth grade is an extremely challenging year for all students, um, even those that are really well adjusted, you know, can really oftentimes struggle with ninth grade. You know, you're leaving that small little cocoon of, a, of where you've been likely for K through eight and then, you know, moving on to particular now place, a much larger school, um, you know, with three towns uh, feeding into it. And, you know, it's even exacerbated for those in, in, in Carlisle um, and my own children are about, one's about to experience it next year. You know, she goes to school in Lincoln and now going to the, you know, the big school of LS. So ninth grade is a really, you know, it's, it's a pivotal year. And um, we wanted to do work about onboarding kids to high school in a more systematic way. We have a great um, freshman orientation. Uh, we do have specific advisory programming, specific guidance work for freshmen. But by and large, they're no different than the rest of the school. And, you know, that's that makes a lot of sense. However... Um, you know, trying to say they're just 25% of the school, um, you know, probably in treating them the exact same way. It doesn't make a lot of sense when you're trying to develop connections. We put such a focus on connections with students, with their peers, and then to be, you know, kind of hitting them over the head right away with a really rigorous academic program, you know, can be, um, can be a challenge uh, for kids. And if you're really worried about who you're going to eat lunch with, you know, it's really hard to do well in, in math. And, and so we want to onboard them in a, in a more thoughtful way. In addition to that, we want to, um, we want to, I wish we could do this with the entire school. That's not the plan just to, for those listening. But what I mean by that is, 
if nothing else, we're going to work in teams and talk about kids on a daily basis with the dynamics of a high school schedule. When you have literally thousands of requests, all these different variables, trying to get teachers on a team to talk about kids that they share is really challenging. And and so, you know, we make time, we make time, we make an effort, but it's really hard to get all educators in a room to talk about where are the learning strengths, where are the challenges, what um, what's working in your classroom. And so this will allow us to work as a team um, for, for, for the major subjects, and I'll get a little bit on that, uh, more about that in a second. It's not for the entire freshman um, experience, uh, first year experience, ninth grade experience, but it allows people to work in a team really to support kids. So. Um, a little bit of an update. I would say that uh, this process had begun, even begun COVID-19. And what I mean by that is we were looking to scale things back. We have so many thoughtful, intelligent people working on a committee coming from a different angle. And really all the work was about brainstorming, throwing everything up against the wall and talking through it, doing more research and coming up with the very best ideas to make ninth grade experience um, a great one. So then we, when we got down to do the details of the work, everybody was overwhelmed because it was too much. And so I had to, because we have a really ambitious staff who wanna do a lot. I had to, at the last two meetings, before we even, uh, you know, again, uh, dismissed for COVID-19, I've had to do it more, had to scale it back and say, we don't have to do this entire, you know, brainstorming sheet, it's not possible. So let's prioritize. What do we want to do really well? So, you know, some of the things we focus on, we want to do social most learning well. We talked about common practices. What are what are some things that we can all agree that every staff member is going to do so they're getting a consistent experience? Um, and, you know, what skills do we want to make sure that they leave their ninth grade, uh, their, their ninth grade year with? So just trying to scale everything back, and we've done, and we have done that. And even more so now that we've been out of school, it's not as easy to meet. And you know, we folks were looking at really revamping some of the curriculum, and we've scaled that way back. Because again, if nothing else, working in teams to discuss kids, to make sure we're onboarding them in a very thoughtful way. Um, I know there's a lot of anxiety anytime kids come to high school, and you know now it's exponentially more challenging because they haven't even had an opportunity to wrap up their you know their eighth grade year. Um, but it's still the, the same idea as stronger connections, small learning communities, using a team model to support kids, a focus on social emotional learning. Um, and you know, one of the um, you know, one of the concerns we heard from kids comes a little bit from a little bit of a misnomer, and that is, uh, you know, I'm gonna be on this cohort and I'm never gonna be able to see anybody else. And well, you know, what we've tried to remind everybody is uh, number one, it's you have four classes within a cohort. And so essentially half your schedule is off team, quote unquote, off team. Um, secondly, lunches are not, are not gonna be that way. Um, and your cohort is still pretty large, right? It's 80 plus kids for your four main, um, you know, your main, uh, main classes. So, um, you know, I think that it's in a year from now, it's the unknown that the folks that do have some concern, I think a year from now, um, people will be very happy with, um, with the program. Um, and I, I'd be remiss if I didn't very quickly, because if I forget, um, to just thank Robin um, um, Cicchetti, who is uh, Dr. Robin Cicchetti, who is our, our librarian, who is just a researcher at heart. She's also a teacher, and she led this committee and just has done a fantastic job. So uh, lastly, what I will say, the curricular changes pretty much remain what we talked about previously. Uh, there's none for, for English. Um, that's not to say there might be some, you know, some, we've talked about some interdisciplinary work on a smaller scale and, you know, trying to coordinate when you're reading into thin air with when we're teaching glaciers, for example. So there might be some changing there, but there's, there's no changing in levels. Math, we did reduce the number of levels um, by one. Um, and social studies, no changes. And uh, the, the, the biggest change, at least on paper, is the um, move, changing the freshman science requirement to a planet Earth class, um, moving away from the two separate sciences and having one class that um, you know really could not be um, at this time is very important. And we also feel like taking the stress away of trying to decide what science class you're taking. We know just from surveys that was causing a lot of undue stress. With that being said, I don't want to. Um, minimize the importance of that course in general. That course as a standalone has merit, has a lot of value, and I think the kids will have a great experience and be better for it as a result. 
But that's a snapshot of, I guess, a little bit of an update. Happy to answer any questions. I will say that just overall really excited about it. It's been a really collaborative effort with a lot of people involved. Um, a lot of really good ideas kind of bouncing off of each other. And, you know, I think where we, um, uh, one other change, I'm sorry. Uh, one other change, we, we wanted to have two dedicated guidance counselors who did nothing but ninth grade. And the reason why is, uh, you know, it's hard trying, it's a difficult job anyway, very difficult, but trying to, you know, to be attentive to a ninth grader while trying to help a junior navigate the, uh, the college search process while trying to, to help a senior navigate the application process. You know, those two things sometimes are, you know, they're pulling on you. And, um, and so we want a dedicated guidance counselors who did nothing but freshman uh, academy as it, as it turns out the COVID-19 to change that, um, does that change would have required that we, we change the counselor for some students. And we thought that was, you know, might cause some anxiety, but you know, we, we have a new advisory program that is just focused on the college process run by guidance. So in a normal environment, we felt like we would, we could weather some of those concerns. Um, I'm, you know, I don't want to cause any unnecessary stress. And I think changing a guidance counselor at this point, would be stressful, so we've decided to go with um, uh, with with just more counselors. So there'll be essentially it's it's all of them, and there'll be a couple per cohort. So all right, no questions. Great, Listen, thank you. I really enjoyed being coming tonight. And, um, Don't you move any? Mike. <laughs> Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, sure. I, this has been an incredible amount of work, and uh, and to throw the curveball in in the middle of it. Um, hats off to everybody who's been involved, and kudos to Dr. Chiketti. Um, any questions from the committee? Well, I just offer up a comment, uh, Mike. Thank you for the uh, the update. The reference to scaling back might. Uh, uh, concern people in a high achieving community in a high achieving district like ours. Um, and my, my sense about this is that these, any a minor scale back in curriculum gets, gets offset by uh, equal or greater uh, engagement in the curriculum by ninth graders is that yeah. and, is that an accurate statement yeah let me clarify court i wasn't i wasn't uh, really clear what, what i meant by scale back is um scaling back as a ninth as a ninth grade academy cohort of, of staff all the plans that we had to put in place um and they were really ambitious there was a lot of ideas to do a lot of things you know some different little tweaks and it was becoming overwhelming in a normal environment and then you add this this virtual component, and it was untenable. And we were, you know, we could I could see it even with some academy members were getting a little, you know, a little frustrated, a little concerned, a little anxious because it was just simply too much. So I don't mean scale back. I mean really some of our plans. In terms of the scaling back of the curriculum, there it's it, there really isn't a scaling back. It is just a slower start. You know, it's really hard to focus on let's make sure that we're developing connections with kids we're doing things to build community in our classroom you know this is somebody who is new to the school and yet we're you know we're still on the same pace of you know quiz test so the onboarding it will just be a little slower in the beginning we also have talked about you know the option of pass fail first quarter taking the stress off you can you could accept your grade if you want but you can also take it pass fail so I guess just we're trying to just slow down the onboarding process, let them get acclimated to school, get them a strong foundation so they can be successful for, you know, ninth grade and beyond. So I, I apologize for needing the clarification and I'm grateful for it. Thank you. Yeah, no, you don't apologize. I, I, I Someone usually has to translate what I'm saying. So um, no one's here to do that for me tonight, unfortunately. Thank you. Uh, anybody else? I would also just really quickly add that I know that it was certainly very difficult to keep this going and still plan to launch it this coming year, given all that has happened in the last few months. And I would say it's, it's also even more valuable than it would be in a normal year. I mean, this is a year where students are going to be starting with such uncertainty and, and some anxiety in, in some cases and, and probably feeling a lot of pressure to jump in and figure out how high school works 
in an environment that's uncertain. And so this, uh, this structure feels like it will be even more valuable than it would have otherwise because of this. So thank you for keeping it going. It is, it is of great value to everyone, I think. Uh, I appreciate that. It's, and it's really a testament to the, to the staff members that are going to be you know, doing the work. Um, I, I did have to just say that, we you know, the, cause there was some concerns about, you know, should we even be, uh, should we continue to do it? And it was a, it was a small number, but it was, it's still a legitimate point. You can make a pretty compelling argument. But you know, my my the counter argument is, um, you know, if we could do this with every grade, and that's not the plan. Again, I'm not saying that um, we would. I mean, you think about the, you know, there's even with the best efforts that we made in the spring, there's going to be gaps to fill, and the, for for a science, uh, social studies, math, and an English teacher to be have the same period off and to have a discussion about, you know, why Mike is struggling with X, and what can we do, and how can we prioritize. You know what's working in your class. I mean, that's invaluable any year. Never mind. You know, next year obviously it's even more valuable. So I'm glad we are continuing. Mike, I've been a big proponent of recognizing the difference, uh, the great difference between freshmen coming into the high school and juniors and seniors who are heavily focused on you know what's next for them, and especially now that we've got a sixth grade. Uh, Sixth grade center. We, you know, we, these kids are four for four, three of the four years prior to coming to the high school. They they're the oldest kids in the school, and uh, and then they arrive on our doorstep, and they're the youngest. And there's you know this a different approach, and uh, and they're you know that's just craziness of being in high school. And I this goes beyond that, beyond what I had envisioned. By a long shot, and I, I think it's it's exciting, and you know I think it's over the years going to develop into something uh, uh, that you know, kids are going to look back on and say, "Wow, should have been doing that for a long time." Yeah, I, I agree. So thank you for that. Thanks. I'm excited about. It. Mike, I just have a couple of questions. <clears throat> uh, has there been any? Um, movement to get a better assessment from the eighth grade students that we know are coming from Concord and Carlisle in terms of gaps, especially in languages and maybe math where there's sort of a continuum, you know, not starting yeah. fresh material. So it, we, what we did at the end of this year was we issued what we call the STAR assessment. And so that it, it's in math and English. And um, that it, it tells you where students should be literally in the month of the school year. Um, and so, you know, we, we issue it to all first year students when they come in. And so this year we also, we're still in the process of, fun, you know, a few struggles that haven't just to try to identify where, where the gaps might be in terms of the languages, it's a little more challenging. So no, there was no effort made there. Um, but really that's like some of the work that, that lay ahead, um, with all really stuff. I mean, we can't, you, you can't just hop into algebra two. Um, like we normally would, because mm -hmm. you know, the fact is, it's it's uh, it's they're not ready for it. So, you know, that's where the work lies ahead. But yes, to answer your question, um, you know, English and math were a focal point. You know, for the most part, we have a lot of kids that just perform really well, and they'll be fine. Um, and then for the for the for students that struggle, um, you know, this has probably illuminated some of the you know the weaknesses even more. Some really benefit, obviously from additional support from the teacher face-to-face, -face, from working with the tutor, from going to the mark, from going to the CERC. And all those supports, for the most part, um, you know, weren't available. So, right. you know, there's some challenges um, and that's really, it does cause me some anxiety too, but we're all in the same boat and I know in the end we'll, we'll work through it. And I can just add on to that, that we did the STAR assessment in uh, English and math at the eighth grade as well. So for the Conquer kids, we'll have that data from this month to look at. Kristen's also tracked all the curriculum coverage that's happened during the closure, which obviously also informs us on what didn't happen. Um, mm -hmm. And that will be communicated between department chairs between the middle and high school um, as well. I expect teacher to teacher as we go. So we've got all the systems in place to highly inform the high school what the Conquer um, eighth graders have had, and we're gonna reach out to Carlisle and make sure we get that same information from them over the summer. And I think that will set us up 
a combination of both an aggregate view of what was accomplished and what needs to be looked at, also at a class view and a you know content area view, and all the way down to the individual child view, as best we could given given the the situation we've we've been in. Right, and this isn't I know you know this is throughout the system that we have these concerns, but yep. it, I think it's an extra level of anxiety going from eighth to ninth and maybe fifth to sixth. So given the the sixth grade setup, both virtually and in person, is is very good for that. Um, and it sounds like the ninth grade setup is is going to be a kind of a similar approach, but obviously on a different level. And I think the team structure at ninth grade is going to make the communication just so much more streamlined. As school reopens, there's a group of people to target, not spread across the entire faculty as would typically be. So I think we're in a good place. And I'm really grateful we've managed to keep this afloat because I think it's probably going to be more important than ever yep. um, that this struck in place. Good. Thank you. Good. Uh, if that's it for questions, um, I did want to take the chance now that you're here uh, to thank you for the work you and your staff have done uh, this, this spring. It's been extraordinary and, um, you know, not only in the teaching aspects, but, <clears throat> you know, I have a a senior college student at home and, you know, watched her graduation on her living room television. And, uh, you know, I feel bad for all these kids that are graduating. And, uh, you guys did everything you could to, to make it special and are continuing to do that. So, um, you know, Yeoman's work this year. And, uh, we are very appreciative. Thank you. No, thank you all. And also, you know, thank you for you know, all your service on the committee and for all your support of the school and, and me, so I appreciate it. Thank you. All right, everybody. Well, enjoy the rest of your meeting. <laughs> I think, you, don't uh, want to Come on. you know, if you want, I can do the blank screen and pretend like I am, but I won't be. <laughs> <laughs> all right, have a good night, everybody. Thank Bye. you, Mike. Good night, Mike. Have a good night. <laughs> Okay, so okay. Oh, it didn't work. Task force update. Back to Lori, right? Yeah, so let me give you some highlights. Yeah, I'll give you highlights of what occurred last week for projected into tomorrow's uh, smaller working groups and building based groups. So at the task force meeting last week, we yeah, spent actually a good amount of time looking at a draft of a vision statement that had evolved um, through the feedback from the um, sessions that we had had the weeks prior. Um, it's still a working document, so I'm not ready to bring it to the formal school committee yet as a, as a draft to review. It's still going to need some discussion. Um, but I think it started to articulate an aspiration, and we actually had quite a bit of discussion about that in terms of um, it really sets the tone and the bar fair, quite high for what we're hoping to accomplish. We then had some conversation about how to balance that with the, where do the challenges get named knowing going into that? So the next um, um, work will still be to continue to work on the SWOT analysis, which may be part of that answer. I think we're still deliberating on how to put out that high expectation, but with sort of the context in which we're putting it out. Um, work will still be to continue to work on the SWOT analysis, which may be part of that answer. I think of people and to land on some pretty common themes, I think was positive. Sort of the, um, and again, it's just, do we put it out as a true vision and then worry that if we don't accomplish it, that'll be held against us? Or do we put it out there as a, this is what we're aiming for, knowing there's things that, um, may make this really challenging. Um, and it, again, it's challenging. So we're d debating all of those pieces. Um, worry that we'll meet and we're gonna start to hone in on aspects of the responsibilities of that group. Maybe I don't expect, because the DESE document is not out, we won't get all the way to firm plans, but we've been using California's document in the last week. Um, which aspects of the respond, obviously we will accommodate as Massachusetts gets the document produced, 
but it's been a good starting point to look at what California has been proposing. So each of the four working groups will be taking on a bit narrower focus tomorrow in terms of the topics that they're discussing. Discussing, we may we may get to the point where we're putting up gets the document produced potential recommendations. Um, just waiting to see how it fits along with the Massachusetts document. Um, each of the building-based groups, uh, it will be doing the same and really targeting in. I mean, for the lack of Massachusetts documents, there's a lot of things we do know, um, just based on the patterns of how things are um, evolving from the guidance we're seeing in so many other settings. So that'll give the principals a chance to start to take a look at some of those aspects of how we might tackle some of the things that we can fairly, fairly, and I'll take a venture to say fairly reliably predict um, in terms of, you know, lunch, lunch being one that I, I don't expect we're going to be in a normal mode for lunch. I do not think that will be in the guidance that you can just open a cafeteria with hundreds of kids and act normally. So just trying to look at how that operates. Um, in terms of Jared will be spending some time with his operations group on that. And the buildings will start to consider what those options are for them. So that's just an example. Um, I think overall, it's been a really healthy, positive process. And once we get the DESI document, that will be our spending some time, you know, anchor for the rest of the work that we have to do. Um, I think we're, we're in a good place. I've had a lot of good feedback. I think making the recordings of the large task force available has help, been helpful to people. Um, so to, I think, agree with David's point, let's bring the Massachusetts document to this group and really spend some time on it. I, just the, the media is sending so many mixed messages. Let's be the source of information and tell folks that if they haven't gotten any information from us about it to question it a little bit because the media is misinterpreting some things. So we want to be the source of information. I think we're off to a, the media is sending a good start on that. And I'm happy to hear any other comments, feedbacks. So you've all been very involved, so I don't feel like this should just be me reporting out. But any other updates you want to want to offer are welcome too. And I'm. I, I guess what I could offer up is that uh, for for anyone else who sh who shares our eagerness to uh, quantify what we're going to do and how we're going to do it. Uh, we were simply not able to do that quite yet because we can't announce working assumptions quite yet. And working assumptions right. are going to govern so many decisions. Mm -hmm. That's completely right. Um, oh, some other moving pieces that I should update you on. We have surveys out to the middle on high school students, so we'll be right, trying they have um, administered, administered their surveys, and that's completely right. Um, oh, so us and responses to us for the task force to work with. And we have a parent survey very close to ready to go before the week is out, asking for parent input on a wide range of things from feedback on the um, remote learning experience, including the technology task force and the learning and challenges, but also projecting forward um, in terms of what 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 they think is going to work for them. Uh, we've been getting a lot of advisories from DESI and um, districts around us uh, that starting to get a sense of families thinking on terms of what decisions they may make for their their kids. What what they. Um, if we were to be open in a hybrid mode, would they send them? Trying to get some data, at least soft data to work with, because one of the obvious concerns here is as we get into July, trying to anchor numbers of kids that will be coming, um, numbers of kids who may or may not be coming, et cetera, or flat out, do we, can we have certain, are there certain families who just aren't going to send them and we need to provide remote learning to them, but also on the personnel side and making sure that we start to, work with the unions and the teachers and um, all of you to get a better sense of what the staff needs from us for options and what's gonna be a doable option and what isn't. So um, those seem high level priorities to me in terms of the planning, because to Court's point, some data goes a long way. If we have better, a, a bigger percentage of kids not going to attend, no matter what the hybrid mode is and all the safety pieces we put in place, we need to plan for a, a, a year's worth potentially of remote learning for them and make sure we're ready for that. So 
Uh, I think we're on track to gather all the feedback we're hoping to and the data we're hoping to. And uh, obviously, July is going to be a real month of getting some concrete pieces together. I'm very grateful we've had so much of June to do some conceptual work uh, and step back and think through not only what are we trying to accomplish, but some of the navigating uh, obstacles we have to navigate to um, to be able to, to do that. So some. It feels good. I, I feel really good about the, the structures we've put together and the ebb and flow has been positive so far. So we'll keep you aware and uh, report out every week. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Any uh, other questions there? No. Okay. Why don't we move to the budget? So I'll, I'll cue you up. And then Jared's going to take it from there. We had two follow-up pieces to last week's discussion that um, I think to Court's point, maybe you do start to help with, a, with a, at least a, a couple of the early assumptions we need to figure out. So I'll, I'll, um, one was the capital plan for Concord and the ERU um, possibilities. We had been debating whether there was... Um, if we weren't going to request the whole amount, was there a middle amount to request so that um, we didn't lose momentum completely and what was the impact of that? So Jared can help with that and Russ is here. And then the second piece was a been debate about prepaying the technology at the high school, the hardware. And so Jared spent a good portion of his week talking with Peter Kelly and getting a sense of the um, inventory and where we're at and bringing some information to you for discussion. So, Jared, you want to take it from there? Sure. Uh, so, why don't we start with the capital uh, capital discussion? So, Russ is here. We did talk this week. Um, so, if you remember, most of the ERU projects were scheduled to be done this summer. Um, so, if they're not going to be done this summer, we feel that we could potentially pull, put them off the next summer if we have to. Uh, we have about six hundred ninety thousand dollars that are. Uh, set aside for that, that would probably have just uh, taken care of the Alcott. Um, we would save about 25000 per location at this point, maybe a little bit more once we get through a full year. Um, so pretty much the main discussion that we had was, can we do without, if need be, what would be the negatives uh, of this? Um, and... Um, and I'll even let Russ speak to, to some of the potential negatives. Um, but I just want to reiterate, too, that we're doing everything mandated and then some um, to make sure that the air quality in our buildings are suffice and fine. Uh, so I just want to make sure people do know that, that if we do put this off this year, um, that is not um, going to really affect the, that won't affect the air quality. You want to go ahead, Russ? Did I miss it? Yeah, no, I... I agree with Jared. Um, you know, the units are old, but they're still functioning. Um, there's a total of six units, our ERUs at the Alcott, and we're really only having a problem with one on the heat wheel, uh, but we can manually operate it on really cold days. And um, the other units, like I say, they're just old and they, they are gonna fail eventually. Uh, but for now, we can still make repairs if needed uh, to get us through. Um, these units um, were originally designed for heat only. Then they were modified to, uh, we added uh, air conditioning to these uh, systems a few years back. So, um, I mean, it will be nice when, when, they do, when we can go ahead and, and complete them. So... Um, uh, Jared and Russ, can you qu uh, clarify the 25K that you mentioned? Was that an annual offset? That, yeah, that's, that's... Go ahead. Go ahead, Jared. If, you... and, and energy savings was... Um, so I, I estimated like a 10% savings annual with the newer... If they're, when they're all... When they are all replaced. Correct. Got, thank you. And one thing just regarding this exercise is I believe the moderator is also trying to I misunderstood this a little bit, but I think she's trying to understand what we absolutely need to have voted on in 
July, August, September, we're not really sure yet, versus uh, needs in that potentially they might be scheduling a special town meeting on top of this. So it might be useful to reach out to Carmen Reese to find out exactly what's going on um, because I think it's, it, she hasn't come to us directly and maybe that might be valuable to just understand that or for somebody, one of the chairs to discuss with her what she's exactly looking for in terms of articles. Do you, does that make sense? Heather, you have a, so. Yeah, Lolly, let's coordinate, but one of us can reach out and clarify. <laughs> Um, so I guess the question is on the timing, if this was put off until next summer versus, uh, I'm trying to think, oh, when you have a week in the building, which we're not, it's, who knows when that could be, it could be sooner rather than later. Or if maybe we have a meeting before the spring and that that could happen in the spring. But maybe it would just be useful to get a clarification so we don't. Yeah, I think if we just figure out what uh, we're trying to do, it's probably also somewhat contingent on when we're able to get the, the meeting itself done. Exactly. So I think she's trying to figure if you could really streamline it to three articles or something, right. three budget articles, and that would be it. And maybe she could get it done in July. So I don't know. I'm just, I'm. I guess I'll weigh in, and I'm not sure how much I'm public is appropriate we've been talking with carmen about open dates at the high school um mm -hmm. we kind of know what she's thinking which would be more the fall so, right but i think a formal conversation would be a good idea not about the not about the facility but about the articles and the yeah. plan for the content of the meeting rather yeah. than the logistics yeah okay so that probably well, leaves us go ahead heather well, no, I was just have, I, I had a follow up question back on what Jared and Russ were talking about on the, the units themselves and the investment. Um, I'm trying, I would love to get a feel for kind of what your and our recommendation would be then. It sounds like if necessary, we can hold off on all of those until next summer. Would the recommendation still be, would be better to do the Alcott ones if possible? Or are we saying, no worries, we'll just hold off? I have my opinion, but the you want to go ahead, Russ, and then yeah, uh, you know the units are old and they're going to need to be replaced. They're they're pretty much approaching end of life here, um, so but they can we can hold off till next summer if needed. Okay. So uh, we have monies in there for repairs, and we're doing preventative maintenance. I'm also looking though a couple of years down the line, a couple of years down the line, we have big Ripley needs. Mm -hmm. So just to, so I, it could escalate into more money in the future for, you know, potential Ripley or even if the ERUs, the prices do go up. We yeah. did bid them out. Um, Russ, if I remember correctly, it was around what we had thought. Uh, do, do, do you expect them to go up much if we waited a year or? hard to tell Maybe it's hard to problems. say it's yeah so so yeah so again it, my, my biggest concern is you know just making sure that we're fiscally responsible for the future yeah. um and but now yeah i think one of our goals that, that we had accomplished at least on paper was strategy strategizing the ERU replacement and the Ripley needs within the 900,000 that the town manager allocates over the next five years without needing a separate capital article. I, I do suppose that lowering this now and, you know, kicking the can essentially puts some potential risk back yep. that we, at some point we may need a separate capital article for a project that just can't wait because time went too long. Um, so that that I think is out there. Um, I don't think we know for sure, right? It's 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 that same challenge of when you save money now, do you pay later? And I don't think the it costs will increase. I think you might just hit a point where it's urgent, versus now where we're eking along some of these things. So and we're all of a sudden we just have to do a lot at once because we've pushed it off. 
And that, that's where I was going with this. So I, yeah. so right. I guess I feel like if, if we have to give formal feedback as a committee, my recommendation would be that our committee feedback is, as you said, if necessary, yes, we can wait until next summer, but we don't feel that that's the most fiscally prudent thing to do when looking at long-term because we could be creating some big humps in the future, maybe even near future, that could require a larger investment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, does that, I wanna make sure, no. I just kind of stated it in my words, does that, does I would that concur with that, Heather. Thank you. Okay. Yep. Yep. I would agree. That, that seems to be the approach that protects these facilities. Uh, the only question I would, would put forth is, is there any value in any further discussions with the town side around the overall capital needs uh, such that our decision has that larger context, if for no other purpose than a than a courtesy, and I don't mean to minimize it when I say that. What I think there is, I think we should get more formally synced up as we're both debating what to do here as we rebuild budgets and warrant articles. So I think you're absolutely right. We need to have that conversation with them. Would you want to have that with Stephen or would you sure. want the chairs and the chairs? What would folks recommend? Yeah, what's your preference? I think it's probably worthwhile doing it with Stephen first. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, if it gets to the point where there's uh, something that's other than what we're used to doing that's coming out of those conversations that we may want to escalate that a bit. Okay, so let me touch base with him on where where they are and then we can decide what to do from there. Because essentially what we're doing is discussing collective risk on behalf of the entire town. Yes, I, I, that's fair, I think. Yeah. Okay, and then that feedback that we're giving is feedback that's going back to Carmen, correct? Right. Just to close this circle, circle here. After there's been clarification with Carmen as to what she's asking, I think Cynthia After makes what a she's really asking. good point. Right. Yeah. Yep, exactly. Okay. But we'll have to have these conversations with FinCom as well, eventually. Yes. yes. Right. Um, okay. Okay, should we go to the high school technology discussion? So, um, yep. And Peter, there's Peter's here too, Peter Kelly. Hi, Peter. Hi, everyone. Hi, Lori. Hey, I'm going to log off. Have a good night, everyone. Okay, should we Trust. go to the high school Thanks, technology Russ. discussion? Uh, bye. Bye, bye. Thank you, Russ. Bye. And, and, and just to start, if you remember, the reason for this is because uh, we have, you know, two weeks left in the fiscal year. Um, I do have monies left over at the high school to offset our budget for next year. Um, I would recommend potentially to go ahead and, and prepay next year's um, laptop um, commitment. And um, the reason just for that is just because if we were going to skip a year, I don't think FY21 would be the year. I think as we build FY22s, maybe. Um, Cynthia asked for some um, inventory numbers and, and Peter did a great job this week. I, I no, no. Um, and um, go ahead, Pete. <laughs> sure. Um, I just say from a big picture standpoint for technology, uh, the both districts have done a great job maintaining the five-year replacement cycle uh, for the past decade plus. And that benchmark has served very well over time from a standpoint of wear and tear and then advancements in technology. Um, so as you probably all know, we're working our way out of the BYOD lease program that started when the high school opened. If we maintain our purchase cycle, we buy this summer, we'd have two more summers before we would own with the district assets of laptops, similar to how the middle school has run. Um, we'd own the program outright then. And that's there's a lot of advantages to that. So I think for Jared's uh, point of the opportunity, if it's available this time, to grab those high school freshman laptops, 
And obviously with the time that we're in, we have, for the first time, we have student laptops home with the students in the summer. Typically that's our time. We get them back at the end of the year. We do our maintenance. And now we're looking at how do we transition the rising ninth graders, get eighth graders with laptops and get them their freshman high school laptops. That's sort of the first transition point. If we can manage that one to open this up, we get the eighth grade laptops back um, and Sean over at the middle school can look at them, prep them for the incoming sixth graders. The current sixth and seventh graders are, made, are keeping their laptops as they go into next year. Um, so as we discussed, we, we can manage with what we have next year. I'd, I'd say that over the course of the time that I've been here, we've had a couple of periods where maybe we fell short of the five-year replacement cycle. And the one takeaway from that I would have is that if you get two years out of a replacement cycle, it becomes daunting to make your way back. One is doable, one you can sort of have a refresh and, and work quicker. You get into two years out of the five-year cycle, you get a really big hole, big hole to, deep, to dig out of. So for this year with the financial structure that we're looking at, I think Jared's notion of pre-purchasing the freshman laptops is a great opportunity to move things forward into the fall. I would, uh, given what we may be dealing with in the fall, um, with some remote learning issues, um, it would seem to me we'd want to make sure our technology is as current as it can be. Makes perfect sense to me. I would agree. I would also advocate to do this. Um, I have a quick question, budget-wise, just in terms of how it works. If we're prepaying now, um, it, they still sit in the FY21 budget, but if they're prepaid, does that mean that what we're asking the town for is any less? No. If, if that's going to be part of your discussion because you won't have to carry it in the FY21 budget. As a committee, we can decide that as we zero base, we, can just we won't have to carry it. Okay, so this year. it can come out of, if we prepay now, it can actually come out of the FY21 budget. Yes. Okay, well, yep. that seems to make a lot of sense to me. Yeah. <laughs> Bear in mind, I mean, we have this discussion all the time in Carlisle. Um, you're, I mean, if it comes out of your budget, that's true, but your practice, if your practice is generally to prepay, you need to have a budget line item for the prepay that you're going to do in, in June of 21. Right. Otherwise, you're going to be caught short. So, I mean, it really mm -hmm. That's right. needs a philosophical discussion of, you know, are we yeah. prepaying regularly or are we not prepaying? And if we're changing, then there's a dislocation. I mean, there's a temptation, I believe, right now for districts to short, you know, most districts prepay something, right? So, and DESE provides the authority for school committees to authorize prepay for certain instances. You don't need the permission of the Board of Selectmen or the FinCom to do that. But if if there's a move, let's say, not maybe conquered, but if there's a move in a district to tighten the budget for one year only and say, well, we'll take advantage of the prepay for 21 in the 20 budget, but then we'll not put a line item in the 21 budget, then 21 comes and you don't have it, right. you know, now you have an extra bump in 22. So it really deserves a little bit of philosophical mm -hmm. thought, in my opinion. I totally agree with you, David. Yes. Yep. You've got to project out how the, the way you want to manage this. Right. Generally speaking, you know, if you prepay 250000 this month, you're probably going to do the same a year from now. So there's really no impact on the budget. It's just timing of money. Mm -hmm. And Jared and Peter, what do you expect for expenditure for next year? Well, if we if we purchase the laptops now going into next year, um, that is, you know, we have one purchase cycle right now that we're working with one to one programs we buy going into the school year. Mm -hmm. uh, so that would be it on the hardware side. And, and I also like to remind people that that line encompasses staff as well. That's, we used to separate that out, but it's one line for student staff laptops. So part of that purchase will go to upgrading staff laptops as well. Uh, but that would be it on the hardware side is going into that year to my understanding. 
<laughs> for FY22, <clears throat> do you would need would you need to make a similar purchase? Yes, annually we're buying annually now. Um, uh, going as I said, we are three years out from moving away from that lease to own program we had here in the BYOD. And at the end of those buying cycles, um, the high school program would mirror the middle school and the fact that the district would uh, own the assets in it. So yeah, the site, the buying cycle would continue. So now, my concern is that, you know, next year is gonna be harder. <laughs> so we might have to say, we can't do this next year. Um, what, so the assets coming in from the senior class, I assume those, you know, in, in some worlds, would might turn around and go to the ninth graders, right? If you didn't right. get this. Um, so we have coming back in, we've got um, probably about, I think we have uh, 214, 15 laptops coming in that are 2015s. Right. So by our replacement cycle, those will go out. But we will look at those, um, you know, you'd weed out the ones that have some wear and tear and damage. And then, yes, we can still put those into play as need be. Um, we've done that at the middle school as well in the elementary. That's, uh, we don't try and, um, I'd say our buying right now is so targeted uh, in the past where IT might've pushed out in the beginning of this technology surge where we were putting technology in the classroom. Now we are so in tune to teaching and learning and the, the buying and the purchasing is tied into what um, we're offering academically. So it's very tight. And my point there is that we used to have far more um, assets available spares, replacement pile. That's We're much tighter now. Our numbers are yep. very tight. So we will keep recycled assets uh, ourselves at times, even if it's a little aged, because we want to have some backup. 2015 is not bad. It's something that we can use. <laughs> for what the, I, yeah, for what the- No, I will add, what, yeah. um, on the sort of the five-year side, this is what we came into this year, and it's a good anecdote. Apple made a change and started putting out a security chip. Yep. What that did to us was blow up our entire way of imaging our laptops. And yep. we had to reinvent <laughs> right, <laughs> the their world of wanting MDM, which is mobile device management, yep. which makes a lot of sense in a lot of ways. And it gives us some advantages. But every five-year cycle, there's going to be things like that where so you'll maintain older assets, but they become a little bit of a liability in management and putting them out there. Not impossible. You just make nuances to how you manage your fleet. But... Those are the type of things that come up in those five years for sure. Yeah, and, and you know, I would personally support um, this purchase, but I would just ask, I mean, this is not, a, that we be particularly careful of preparing for maybe we can't do this next year. And, you know, we'll just- Oh, I agree with you. And, and we won't be doing our annual recycle right out of the gate this year. We'll hold on to the assets that come in, ones that would normally be recycled. And they have the potential to be reused, and we'll we'll keep them in house um, and prepare for what might be coming over the next couple of years. Yeah. Okay. Cool. And I think, correct me if I'm wrong, Peter. At the beginning of this, you said if we had to skip a year, that next year is better than skipping this year, right? I think that's where Jared is coming in. Yeah, maybe Jared. Budget. Jared can step in on that um, because of the because we have the monies due to the frozen budget. Yeah. And we have yeah. the monies this year. Got it. Okay. That's where that, that was, yep. that was a budget and, comment. And we have to spend, yeah. Can you just clarify something for me? I mean, we're not moving our purchase by a year. We're moving it by three weeks, isn't that? We would be making this purchase this summer, right? We'd just be doing it after the 30th. Yeah. This purchase so would not, be, so this purchase, I have a quote already. I'd put it in right now. Yeah. So we're only, I mean, this whole issue about moving the budget uh, and having to deal with this next year, I mean, you will build a budget in the fall that will be like this year's budget was, or this coming year's budget was, which had this line item for purchase of laptops in it. And the only thing that's happening right now is a, a two-week shift in when you make the purchase. It will come out. I just want to be sure you're all on the same page. You're you're debating taking it out of the FY20 surplus because of the closure rather than out of FY21. I think to David's point, you don't have to decide the 21 impact right now. You've got another month to do that with us. Um, tonight, we're just trying to you know make sure FY20 spending is moving along the way it needs to because of the time that's going by. So that's 
that's the difference, Wally. It's the it's the the pot of money it's coming from. Yeah. Well, I was just trying Not to get a prepaid thing because if you're what David is saying, and he's right, if you're in the habit of prepaying things, uh, then you need to you need mm -hmm. that. You would need that line item in this fiscal year 21 budget. But in effect, what we're doing is shifting by days rather than a year, yep. which is what we would then be in uh, this sort of prepay issue. Do you, I mean, do you um, normally prepay this stuff, the no. computers? No. no. So I, I would never recommend prepaying. The only reason why we're doing that now is because we're late, we're middle of June. So when we do our budget, you voted, you know, mid December. So we're not going to know where we're going to be. So we, we don't plan to prepay. Um, but I mean, in, in a normal year, Jared, you do not pre-buy the computers. No, we. Th there has been a habit of I mean, a good habit. If this money's left over for special ed tuitions, but there's not. There's only 100, 150 grand of that, right. but not for technology. Um, we, right. That has not been uh, the habit. Okay. So are you? I mean. This is because you have your normal four or five year cycle. You're, to to Wally's point, you're just accelerating that by three weeks. No, no, no. Because our, we've we should have had town meeting, and we should have had. This oh, okay. So you're for our budget. But we still wouldn't. Hey, we wouldn't buy them until the first of July. Right. Right. New fiscal year. But and if yeah. it's but you put them in your article. I mean, they're in the budget, so you're spending yeah. to your budget. Right. And, and the only difference, I guess, is if Jared's predictions are correct and 21 or 22 are worse years and you need a place to f save some money, you can always defer that, right? And use that for something else. We'll have to have that conversation. Well, I, yeah, well we may defer I, it right out of the gate. Well, I think that does become the big question. Although, like you said, Wally, the, the purchasing is only changing by a few weeks. I think the bigger question, um, similar to what Lori was saying, is, is whether we keep that line item in the 21 budget. Because if we purchase them now and then take it out of the 21, when we're building the 22, it's going to look like a big bump. And that's kind of the debate that we have to have in building the 21, to mm -hmm. some extent. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And, you know, which gets back to the question that, that, that we've asked before, if we take, if we choose to really take a hit and lower it this year, will that be remembered, you know, in subsequent years when we need to catch up for things? And we'll just have to make sure that we keep good records and remind people. Well, it's that. more, I, I, yeah. I actually think it's, I, there's that component and that's certainly a component for CPS to consider because you're completely beholden to the town, but the region has a little more autonomy to, Kind of make its own decision. I think the bigger thing for me is, I think Jared was he was alluding to is, you have the money, you can buy it, and you if you think that there's a chance you're going to need to stretch the capital equipment an extra year, next year, the year after, some combination. At least you freshened up what you can, right? I mean, yeah. you're a little bit, you're in better shape if you yes. buy what you need to buy now and. Who knows what next year looks like? At least you'll go in there with a an asset that hasn't aged as much. Mm -hmm. Right. You defer it now, you're guaranteeing that you're going to have a tougher, you know, sooner or later. Because in any capital project, in any, you know, uh, rejuvenation of your physical plant, anything like that, you can only defer for so long. Mm -hmm. So I'm I'm personally in favor of buying what you can now. Make sure you have you know, equipment that's as new as it can be, and then you're in a better shape to do that belt tightening next year because at least the stuff is a little younger. Especially in a year when we might have really high technology needs next right, year. Right, right. So, I mean, I, I, I presume, Peter, you're retiring, obviously, the oldest stuff, right? Yeah, oh, without question. Right. Uh, so well, you, you're getting rid of the most vulnerable layer and you're that much better off. So Yeah, the ones that get out of a warranty become not worth, you know, fixing, yeah, right. take those out of the pot. Now, it, but, you know, that may be true, but that's not to say we won't be, not we all, but people won't be in this meeting a year from now and say, you know what, we're going to limp along with those five years laptops. We're just going to limp along with them. Warranty, schmorranty. We don't have the yep. flexibility. But that's better to have it having stripped out the, aging layer this year, in my opinion. Well, we've certainly had to do that in the past uh, at various times where budgets have been tight. And uh, we met as a group this past week 
and we're comfortable uh, maintaining what we have as long as we need to. Right. Good. And a quick clarification, is the, uh, is the laptops that you are uh, re replacing at the high school, are, the, are these the 12 graders uh, laptops with the tiny, teeny screens that we are replacing, hopefully with um, a little larger uh, sc screens this year? Right, it will probably take some time to remove all the 11 inch Mac Airs from circulation. Um, Apple only changed everything to 13 a few years ago. So they're gonna hang around probably uh, for a little more um, length of life, but yeah, all new ones, they only make 13 inch. Those are the ones that come in. Um, so we'll do the best thing we can to retire what's, what's reasonable. Okay. Okay, Lori, does that give you the feedback you yeah, need it, it, it does, it does. So Jared will work that through and that'll be part of how we close FY20. Okay. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Can I just say something before Thank we move you. on because it's still the budget update. I completely forgot to yeah. uh, stop uh, Laurie during the retirees and the recognitions. I have a, uh, a retiree in my office who's been for the with the district over 30 years, Patty Seichman, um, staple of the payroll department for the high school. Um, so I just want to make sure that, that we recognize her for all her service and we're certainly going to miss her. So, Jared, on behalf of all of us, extend our, our thanks, our appreciation, our congratulations. Uh, uh, getting getting people's uh, paychecks to them uh, faithfully and accurately uh, every cycle is uh, work that goes unseen by some people. But uh, Patty Patty was uh, there uh, endlessly for many years, making sure that it uh, happened and happened accurately. So she's, she's got our sincere gratitude. Thank you. Definitely. Yeah. So the next item we have is the action item we talked about last week for, to approve the MASC funding resolution of the legislature. Um, assuming people have had a chance to think about this, um, why don't we have a motion to approve it? Um, and then do you want me, has everybody looked at it? Do you want me to read it or screen share it or, or anything? Uh, Why don't you read it, Heather? Very short. Yeah, it is pretty short. Okay. Um, there are three whereas phrases, which is basically if schools are to reopen this fall, it is the responsibility of each school district to do so safely and responsibly. The second, whereas it is the responsibility of the state to ensure that each school district is able to pay for the enormous additional staffing, transportational, and material expenses required to do this. And third, whereas the state cannot expect mandatory COVID-19 safety guidelines to be followed without also ensuring that each school district has the funds required to implement these guidelines. Therefore, let it be, and the resolution is, resolved that the state must guarantee every school district full reimbursement for whatever COVID-19 expenses are required to follow state mandates. We must ensure a statewide school reopening that is safe, responsible, and equitable, there can be no unfunded mandates for COVID-19. That's it, really, that there can be no unfunded mandates, that they fund any mandates they give us. So I, I support this uh, largely in sympathy with other school districts that are uh, much more insecure than our own. Mm -hmm. And I have confidence that uh, the legislature will continue to be progressive in their thinking, trying to equalize resources for throughout the Commonwealth. Uh, so I think our support for this uh, benefits uh, uh, children throughout the Commonwealth. And I think the legislature uh, uh, will benefit from, from hearing our formal support. Uh, I think we join what, <laughs> upwards of 40, 40 cities and towns so far that have adopted some identical mm -hmm. uh, a sentiment or recommendation, if I'm correct. I would, I would oh, go ahead. Do we have other comments from other committee members? No, I think it's, uh, you know, it's, it's just getting the PPE is devastating for some 
larger, less wealthy districts. So I think that we, as the state needs to do something to help them or else they're just gonna have to let more and more teachers go just to get the safety mandate, so. I guess I'm, I'm kind of troubled by the declarative statement because I mean, the fact is at the end of the, I mean, I, I kind of get it about solidarity, but you know, if they, if they flow down these requirements and they don't fund it, what are you going to do? Not do the requirements? I mean, we got to do them anyway. So the tone of it seems kind of like, we're not going to do this unless you pay us. Like, yeah, you are, you know, you are, because you're not going to have a choice. So I, I worry a little bit about making those kind of declarative statements. I'm not really sure I'm on board with I think you're right, David. It doesn't change whether people will have to follow the mandates. To me, it's a, a statement in advance showing solidarity in asking them to fund the mandates. Right, and but the way they said it was kind of not the way I would have said it. Let's put it that way. You know, I would have framed it more like you can go ahead and do this, but it's going to understand that if you don't fund it, we're all, we have no choice but to cut true, you know, pedagogical resources or educational resources. And instead they're saying, we're not going to do it unless you fund us. Like it just, I don't know. I don't, I don't think it, it doesn't say that, does it? No, oh, I don't know. I, it doesn't say we're not going to do it. It's, it's basically, uh, you know, the, that effect is to implore the legislature to fund any mandates. Um, if they give us mandates, that's what they are. And we have to, yeah, we have to fund them if they don't. Um, I think I get where the, the strength of the language comes from. Um, is you know we're you, know, you gotta be serious about this because you know as well as we do that if you don't fund these, then it's gonna come out of other aspects of the budget. And having been around when we were dealing with covering unfunded mandates. Um, yeah. You know, I, yeah, I, okay. I don't I mean, think I, just for the uh, less well-to-do districts, it hurts us too. Yeah, I mean, I guess I don't, listen, I don't care enough to say we shouldn't <laughs> sign it. I just, I'm pointing out that it's yeah. a little hypocritical. And furthermore, the real cost is not going to be that, right? It's going to mm -hmm. be when they say 10 per classroom. Yep. Yeah. And Boston Public has a third of the kids, not a half. You know, we may be able to maneuver our way to sort of half time in class, half time out of class by bulking up a little. They won't be able to do that, right? They'll have a third of the time, which is a big difference. So, or they'll have to put huge amounts of resources to get more teachers in. So, you know, it's kind of Court and I sort of had this a different way of this discussion when we were talking about the statement that. Uh, we issued last week. There's nothing wrong with it. It's just, but it doesn't really have any teeth. It, it just, you know, we should be a little more, I don't know. It's very hard for me to articulate this. There's solidarity is great, but you know, we, we are a leading district and we should be more critical of what we say. And that to me does it, that statement to me is an empty statement. I, I just didn't find it resonating. That's just my opinion. I'm well, I, I agree with you, David. I think it is a solidarity statement. And, and uh, you know, one of, one of my concerns is that I wouldn't want anything that we do to uh, put uh, anybody else in jeopardy because needs elsewhere are vastly greater than our own. Um, but I'm comfortable that this is a symbolic gesture and that the that everybody is going to share pain, cities, towns, and uh, state budgets. Yeah. Okay. And that's that's the only thing that gives me comfort about this, um, because we can't ask the legislature to do what the legislature can't do. Mm -hmm. uh, all we can do is say, uh, uh, be sensitive to, to the uh, extraordinary financial uh, burdens that are coming our way. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Uh, Any further discussion? Sure. I'll read the motion. I move that the Concord and Concord Carlisle School Committees vote to approve the MASC funding resolution to the legislature. Second. Second. 
Is that for both on both? For both, thank you. Okay. Um, do we have any further discussion? Well, only that uh, if we could write our own uh, uh, resolution or recommendation, we probably would, but that's not uh, a viable option this time around, as I see it. Right, I would agree with the court. <clears throat> so, um, why don't we do a roll call vote? Um, Rainey? Aye for both. Out. Aye for both. Booth. Aye for both. Modell. Aye for region. Ms. Taffy. Aye for region. Johnston, aye for both. Thank you. Um, quickly, well, before we um, adjourn to executive, this maybe is just a note because I should have caught it earlier, but although we heard from CEF, we didn't actually take a vote to accept their donations. Um, and I don't know that that, but we could do it now, but it's probably better to put it on an agenda. Um, I'm guessing. So, Lori, can we just put that on the agenda for next time? Yep. Sorry, I didn't catch that when you. No, I, I didn't have. I didn't have the total amount until this morning, so I couldn't oh. put it on easily. So. Perfect. We're going to meet. We're meeting next week anyway, right? So. Yep. Yes. Yeah. Probably, unless the unless we think the guidance is not going to come out. <laughs> hmm. Okay. Um, good. Uh, can we uh, move to executive session? So we need a motion for both committees uh, to move that the Concord School Committee and Concord Carlisle Regional School Committee will enter into executive session under purpose two of the open meeting law to conduct strategy sessions in preparation for negotiations with non-union personnel or to conduct collective bargaining sessions or contract negotiations with non-union personnel and purpose three of the open meeting law to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining or litigation if an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the bargaining or litigating position of the public body and not to return to open session. Do we have that motion for both committees? So moved for both. Second for both. All right, thank you. Then uh, any further discussion? <laughs> I'll go through the roll call. Booth? Aye for both. Rainey? Aye for both. Johnston? Aye for both. Modell? Aye for region. Mustafi? Mustafi, Eva, are you there? I think she already left. Oh, no, there she... oh, she's here. She's muted. Eva, you're muted. Eva, do you have a vote? Say aye, Eva. She's muted. Do we need her? Don't we? we I think we have enough. Uh, okay. Even without her, the the vote carries, and we are adjourned into executive session. One yeah. one abstain for an yeah. one abstain. Yes. Abstain. <laughs> I have no Wi-Fi, but but I for region. Oh, there ah, we go. Okay. Now it passes unanimously. <laughs> All right. All right. We'll see you all in exec. <laughs> Thank you to everyone else. Goodbye, everybody.